Welcome everybody. My name is Todd Harris. I'm the Director of Marketing at Select. And thank you for joining us today. I'm once again joined by Vivek Farias, our co-founder and CTO at Select. And also with us today is Paul Schottmiller, who is a partner at Kurt Salmon's Retail Analytics and IT Practice. So welcome, Paul. Great to be here. Thanks, Todd. So today we're going to start off with Paul covering a little bit about some of the problems that retailers are facing. Um, he'll also talk a little bit how they're operationalizing analytics and some of the returns that they're seeing. Um, and then mo moving on after that, we'll talk a little bit about uh, the power of analytics with Vivek, specifically about something we're calling choice modeling, and also how Select can provide you critical insight and context from your existing data. So again, welcome, Paul. Welcome, Vivek. And let's get going. Quick intro to Select, and this, we'll do this right before Paul, this, uh, Paul intros us to Kurt Salmon, but very quickly about Select in case those of you who haven't been on any of our previous webcasts or are familiar with us, we're a predictive analytics and choice modeling platform. We're based out of Boston. Uh, we are SaaS-based, as a quick note. We allow retailers to understand how an individual customer shopping in their store or online chooses from an assortment of products. And why is this important? With this, retailers can better optimize assortments, both online and in store. So as you can see to the right there, you've got a sample of a few of our customers. There's a bunch more on our website if you want to take a look. And if you're looking through the news maybe on Tuesday, you might have seen an announcement that we put out there about Urban Outfitters as a new customer. So that was very, very exciting. And we hope to, uh, uh, to keep adding to that list in the near future. So definitely keep tabs on, uh, on select.com. So after, over the past year and a half, we've also been recognized in a few ways, one of which you see below is from MIT CSAIL. And CSAIL is the Computer Science and Artificial Intelligence Laboratory. And what's really neat is that they listed our underlying technology in their top 50 greatest innovations, alongside things like encryption and robotics, and even the internet, I think, is on that list. So we're very, very, very happy about that. So Paul, why don't I move it over to you and you can take us through Kurt Salmon and throw to Kurt Salmon and a, and a few interesting points about what you guys do and especially how we're working together. Great. Thanks, Todd. Um, Kurt Salmon is a global management consulting firm, um, most notably uh, in our 80 years uh, exclusively focused in retail and consumer brands. And for those of you on the line in the, in the industry, I'm sure you've heard of us. Uh, probably many even have worked with us. Um, so. Uh, really all about retail and consumer brands, all about the retail value chain all the time. You know, specific to our analytics services, which we're here to talk a little bit about today, um, really helping our clients move along from capturing data, turning those into insights, and then most importantly, finding the value in the insights. Again, heavy, heavy emphasis on that conversion of the insight to the value. You know, as a company, uh, you know, in this business 80 years, they really understand, um, you know, how to unlock that value. Uh, insight without taking that step uh, just uh, doesn't uh, doesn't get you much. Not very relevant. So, you know, we're all about helping our clients, uh, uh, you know, move along that curve uh, and drive toward uh, business value. Next slide, please. So, just a way, a way of a context setting, what we see happening with analytics and the retail and the consumer brand uh, industry set. Um, you know, despite all of the changes in technology and the changes we see happening all around us. You know, the formula for success in retail hasn't changed all that much. It really still is about getting that right product to the right place at the right time and the right price. Um, and again, you know, that's in an environment where we're seeing massive changes, transformation in technology, the way consumers use technology, um, cloud-based technologies, artificial intelligence. Uh, certainly there's more data than there's ever been out there before. Um, it comes faster. It's, it's more current. There's different types of data. We have things like social data and location-based data. Um, and as we, you know, move into the dawn here of the age of the Internet of Things, the Internet of Everything, you know, you're only going to see more data. So there isn't going to be any shortage of data and the types of data. We've got new math that's out there as well um, as we see it being used on this new data um, and not only in, in traditional ways between humans and machines, uh, but also machine to machine. So we've got new data and we've got new, new math. Uh, so what, right? So, so what does that mean for retailers and consumer brands? That's what I care about. Uh, we work with our clients on. Um, so what we believe is that we're really driving towards sort of a next generation of operational performance. Um, and we think about that along a couple of dimensions we have listed here. The first is the ability to drive an increased level of precision 
and especially in how we how we operate as retailers and consumer brands. So think a lot about how to get the right product to the right place and the ways that we use analytics to do that more efficiently and more effectively than we ever have before. Uh, we talk about personalization. This is oftentimes uh, uh, geared directly toward meaningful interactions with our consumers. Uh, at Kurt Salm, we call that one-to-one -one retailing. It's really about how do I start having conversations with my customers that really are you know, much more about the individual as, about, as opposed to about the profile or the persona or the region or the geography um, uh, as we've seen historically uh, in the retail market space. We also talk about prediction. Um, and prediction, you know, not only do we have, we have this data and we have more current data, um, and we, we can sort of sense what happened before, kind of the rearview mirror. Um, uh, we can tell what's going on now, uh, but also the ability to do a better job with uh, this additional data uh, of predicting what's going to be happening. Uh, and this gets exciting on a number of fronts, not the least of which is around consumer behavior, whether you're looking at their behavior online, their behavior in a store, uh, their location-based behavior as it relates to the mobile phone. So uh, next generation of uh, predictive uh, capabilities. I've been working on predictive algorithms in the industry for darn near 30 years now, and we're really uh, approaching um, sort of a next generation set of capabilities here. Um, as you start to look at analytics, and, and you're going to see some of that in some of the tools here uh, uh, with Select. Uh, and then lastly, you know, really hitting heavily on the efficiency side of the equation around automation. So, um, you know, the ability to drive more data-driven decision-making, um, uh, and in particular, we talk about, you know, trying to inject more science into areas of retail that have been typically uh, very art-driven. So think about the areas of product design and development, Think about the areas of merchandise and planning. These have been very centered in sort of the art of retail, and uh, that's certainly not going away, uh, but more informed with, addi uh, with additional science uh, as what we work with our clients on. Next slide. So, okay, so, uh, so if we believe it's got, you know, there's, there's great opportunity out there along some of these dimensions that I've talked about, um, you know, th then it becomes, you know, where should we focus um, and, and how should we focus? And, and this uh, slide is designed to cast a little bit of a framework to answer those questions. So, so we look, we're looking at about five key areas uh, where we're working with our clients and starting to see analytics driving this next generation of performance. Uh, so think about consumer insights, marketing, promotion, forecasting, the whole merchandise planning and buying segment, um, and then uh, the execution on allocation replenishment and the flow, flow to the distribution centers, flow uh, in the sourcing process, flow into the store, uh, et cetera. So if you start to think about what we talked about earlier, the precision, the prediction, personalization, automation, apply those with analytics in those areas, and, you know, and then you know, how do those then infuse into the actual flow, the physical flow of the product across the value chain? Um, and so you know, the, the, the where do we focus uh, you know, is encapsulated here. This is where we're seeing people focus. Uh, you know, now onto sort of the how do we focus, and, and that's really more good news, right? It's not you know, it's not about buying new systems or, or, or actually employing, uh, you know, MIT uh, PhDs like Vivek and, and his partners um, uh, in the technology. Really, uh, you've got the cloud. Um, you've got the opportunity to leverage the things that these entrepreneurs are creating uh, to be able to, um, to, to get those insights, to take those insights then and bring those back into the business. So it's this process of going out and consuming the insights, Generally, in a cloud-based environment is what we see today, and being able to bring those back, um, infuse those into your business uh, to bring more of that science um, uh, into the process. Uh, so you're going to hear a lot more about some of the specifics around uh, areas where we see that uh, working today and areas where Select in particular uh, is going after that. So for, you know, for retailers and brands, the, the answer to the how uh, you know, is, is, is really around building a platform. It's building the platform that allows you to consume these analytics, to get the insights, uh, and then to move those back into your um, uh, into your processes. Next slide, please. So these are some of the key areas. So we talk about uh, solving hard problems and unlocking new opportunities. These are some of the key areas we're working with our clients. We're seeing a lot of activity, um, uh, you know, in product development and merchandising. You know, getting much more localized in terms of assortments, optimizing store assortments, and again, you're going to hear. You know some really cutting edge leading stuff from Select on that um, on that topic. We've got it going on in sourcing supply chain, certainly marketing and consumer insights. No surprise to anybody. Continuing to see a lot of activity around, you know, driving toward that one-to-one -one experience and being able to really optimize the way we're spending and around marketing. 
Um, and then as we get into the channels or the omni channels, we like to call it, we start to think about the store, the website, the mobile phone, uh, and the types of analytics that we're, we're able to uh, get from those uh, areas and the way we're able to apply those um, uh, within those areas. Next slide, please. So how big is the prize? Well, of course, I'm a consultant, so the answer is it depends. Um, and it really does. I mean, you really have to look at this, you know, based on the area of scope and focus, uh, the type of business that you're looking at. Um, but just to give you a sense of just the order of magnitude here and how significant it is, you know, these are the kind of numbers that we're working with uh, and we're seeing with our clients. So, uh, you know, 7 to 12 percent increase in revenue, 6 to 8 points in margin. For those that are focused on the speed to market or the time to market uh, segment, uh, cutting 30 to 40 percent of time out of that uh, across a number of the functions, including development, um, uh, sourcing, uh, and buying. Um, and then, you know, moving over into the efficiency side, uh, looking at 5 to 15 percent decreases in uh, SGNA. And I can tell you, in, in looking in some very particular function areas like merchandising, we've actually doubled the 15 percent um, in some of the clients that we're working with. That's not 100 percent analytics, but it's analytics applied. Uh, and then being able to make the business process and the organizational changes uh, that are associated with that. So if you, you know, if you pull all those together and you put them together in the puzzle the right way, uh, you know, it's not uncommon to be looking for 25 to 40 percent increase in operating um, as part of this, um, uh, as part of this uh, ap a broad application of analytics uh, across a number of these functions. Next slide. And uh, I'll just turn it over to Vivek here in a minute uh, so you can hear a little bit more specifically about how uh, Select does that um, and goes after those types of benefits. Uh, but just to finish off a couple of the sort of lessons learned and success factors that we're seeing as we're working out with our clients. Uh, first and foremost is making sure you're keeping the focus on being business value driven. Um, when we get phone calls from clients saying they're struggling in their application of analytics uh, and seeing the value out of it, oftentimes it's because they're too focused on the technology. You know, it's really easy to get focused on mobile phone apps and beacons and, um, uh, uh, you know, video behavioral analytics and Wi-Fi tracking. And, you know, these are incredibly exciting technologies, um, uh, but they're just technologies. Uh, if you're not able to figure out how to take the information that comes from those, turn those into insights that can then be applied. So making sure you're keeping a strong focus on the business value drivers. Um, you know, really because of the nature of the technology, the cloud-based platforms, you have an opportunity to go fast and to use this test and learn approach. Um, you know, you can move fast, you can try things. It's okay if some things fail and some things succeed, uh, obviously, as you're going through the test and learn. Um, and then, you know, in the test and learn approach, it's important to understand, you know, this isn't, this isn't like trying to install an ERP or a large functional uh, type of IT platform. These are cloud-based um, select and others are cloud-based. So your ability to go out, do a data poll, get the insight generated, uh, and, and brought back to you uh, is much simpler, much faster, much shorter time to benefit than you would get in some of the more traditional uh, IT implementation type work that you know we've done historically and we do we still do today as well um, in, in some in some of the uh, major functional areas. Data quality is always uh, a critical, um, uh, a big focus on that, particularly in the beginning to make sure you get that right. Um, uh, I can't say enough about how important that is to being able to get. Um, to be able to get success and be able to drive the benefit on the other side of this. Uh, and oftentimes the data comes from different places and it, and it has an opportunity to go to different places. Uh, so unless you're in a very specific, uh, answering one or two very specific questions in most cases, getting yourself set up with a lot of cross-organizational sponsorship uh, as part of this uh, is really important. So the words I'll leave you with, sort of the key takeaway, keep in mind uh, here that this is really about translating these uh, these new and these uh, great insights into value, uh, that's really where uh, we're seeing clients win. We're winning with our clients. We're seeing them win in the marketplace. Uh, those that figure out how to make that transition uh, first and fastest uh, are definitely getting uh, the benefit uh, in the marketplace. So I'll turn it back to you, uh, Todd and Vivek, to uh, talk a little bit about our partner select. Awesome. Paul, that was awesome. Thank you so much. And feel free to jump in while we're uh, while we're moving through some of this stuff here. And now Vivek's going to take us through a little bit more about uh, using choice to understand true demand and especially how um, something called context, which is, is if you guys will understand when he goes through it. But I want to take you through a few slides uh, and we can talk through some of this right now. So Vivek. All yours, sir. Uh, thank you, uh, and, and 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 you know, thank, thanks so much, Paul, uh, for setting this up uh, so so nicely. I think uh, you know, I just Paul said something right at the start, actually, 
of, uh, of, 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 of the conversation here, uh, where, you know, he said, there's, we have no shortage of data. That was one fact. And then, uh, you know, in a, in a short, uh, short second later, he said, so what? Right. And uh, this is this is something that's very important to keep in mind. Right. We're, we're basically swimming around in data and everybody's trying to convince you that you need more data. Uh, but uh, we increasingly find, uh, you know, folks that have invested in all of these sort of, uh, shall we say, you know, data streams, as it were, without really thinking through maybe to the question of, great, what, what are we what are we going to do with this? And, uh, you know, is it is it going to help? And so that's that's kind of the point I want to make. OK, so I, I, I guess in the, the short 10, 10 or 15 minutes that I have here, uh, I first want to talk about a type of data. OK, that that that's all, you know, that, that, that that's in many that, that you can get a hold of from many different sources. That's valuable. OK, and I, I, I that that's one point that I want to make. The second point I'm going to make is basically how we can actually use the answering the so what, how we can use this data to actually make an operational difference. And, you know, this comes full circle to a lot of the operational issues that uh, that Paul discussed, uh, you know, as, 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 he, as he was describing, um, uh, describing, you know, innovations in various pieces of the retail process uh, as, it, as it were. So let's start out with something fun, okay? Uh, or I don't know, it's my idea of fun, right, <laughs> at least. Uh, but, but put your, put your uh, you know, political leanings aside. And, uh, you know, I, I have a picture up on the screen uh, right, and uh, you know, it's a, it's a picture of our, it's a picture of our president. Uh, you know, I'm going to ask you a question about this guy, and of course, no, you know, you're you're muted, so you can't really answer the question. But just think of your answer, okay? So my question to you is this, right? Look at this gentleman and ask yourself, right, right, um, how confident does he does he does he appear to be, okay? And uh, you know, I'm going to give that a quick second to sort of settle in, right? How confident does this man appear to be, right? So you look at that, and uh, you know. Uh, you know, he, he's got he's got his sort of traditional sort of uh, smirk on his face, right? A bit of a smug smirk. And, you know, maybe you've translated that in your own head uh, to, uh, to uh, you know, whatever your answer to my question is of how confident this man uh, appears. Um, I'm now going to show you another picture. And then I'm going to ask you a slightly different question, okay? So here's the second picture, okay? I've revealed the sort of the right-hand side. And my second question to you is, which of these gentlemen appears to be more confident? OK, now, um, again, you can't answer me, but because you're muted, but right, I'm willing to bet that irrespective of the answer, right, you found it easier to answer the second question than you did the first. So the first one, I simply asked you and I showed you a picture of Obama and I was like, well, how confident does this man appear? But then when I asked you, well, of these two guys who appears to be more confident, my bet is that, uh, you know, you're, you're, you're going to have a substantially easier time answering that question. And that's not me just pulling something out of a hat. Uh, it turns out that this the, the the research that goes into understanding this is just a fact of of, of how human beings think. Okay, so uh, you know uh, psychoanalysts have actually uh, sort of uncovered this over a hundred years ago. And really, my message to you today, right, is that uh, you know this sort of context, right, that made that made that made that second question that much easier to answer, is actually all over the place in your data. And it's actually data that, if we think about it uh, carefully, we're effectively throwing away. All right. So just like showing you context in this, uh, you know, in, in in this picture made it easier to sort of answer a question. Imagine how unveiling context in your data, right? What imagine what that would do uh, to helping you understand uh, uh, customer demand. So let's let's dig into that concept a little bit. Okay. Um, so. At the end of this whole thing, right? Really, the, the chase is towards understanding true demand. Okay, it's it's this. If I if I could rename the slide, you know, an alternative title for the slide would be building a crystal ball for uh, you know what your customers want. Right, that's what we're all after. Because if we had that crystal ball, business would be easy, and the whole challenge is not having that crystal ball. So you know, you shouldn't let anything fool you. At the end of the day, it's really about this. You solve this challenge, the other dominoes kind of just fall into place. Right, so. How do we actually go about this, all right? Well, here's sort of a traditional approach, right? You might say, well, listen, I've got all of this data about direct demand, okay? So I know that, you know, here's this customer and this guy has gone bought this, uh, you know, this, this, uh, this blue shirt. But in reality, you actually have slightly more information than that, right? You know what he bought. You know that he bought the blue, uh, you know, the blue sweater. But at the same time, you also know that he did not buy the red sweater and he did not buy the you know the black sweater with the with the hoodie uh, attached uh, attached to it 
right? Now, traditionally, right, this second piece of data, the, the, the what you did not buy piece, right, that's something we actually throw away in trying to get towards what demand is. We'll simply use that first piece to get to, okay, look, this is demand for blue sweaters. Really, what we ought to be looking at is demand for blue sweaters as a function of the context of that sweater. When I employ the context of that sweater, and this is something we can get from data, okay, this is something where having data helps. If I can uncover the context of that purchase, just like that picture of Obama v. Putin, right, I actually can understand demand for not just the blue sweater better, but also I understand the role of the red sweater and the role of the black hoodie, okay? So that's what a choice model is all about, okay? A choice model gets towards understanding customer preferences, okay? If that sounds like a bunch of words to you, right, let me actually put it to you in very, very simple terms, right? Sticking with the blue sweater, the red sweater, and the black sweater, right, let's say you go about asking yourself, listen, should I add a green sweater to the mix, right? Or should I take the red sweater out of the mix, right? If you think about those decisions, those decisions aren't decisions that can be made in a vacuum because if you add the green sweater, yeah, sure, there might be people that want to buy green sweaters, but uh, you know that might actually take away demand from the blue sweater, the red sweater, and the black sweater. All those you, you know, all those of you in the audience that are struggling with uh, you know skew counts that are sort of spiraling out of control probably understand exactly what I mean here, right? If I actually add those things in and don't ever take away stuff, right? Uh, what I'm left with is an assortment that's just completely gargantuan and uh, sort of very, very difficult to manage. On the flip side, we know we can't have a very Spartan assortment. Maybe that will actually get us towards, you know, losing customers. So, you know, there's a whole bunch of questions in particular that we could ask, right? Uh, you know, we could say, well, listen, if we sold out of a product in a specific store, what would the right allocation have been? That is to say, you know, if you had 10 blue sweaters and you sold all 10, what should I do next year? Should it be 12, 11, 15? What's the right number, right? Um, if, uh, you know, on the other hand, um, you know, you, you've never sold a blue sweater at store 58. You don't have history on a blue sweater at store 58. How would that blue sweater actually do in store 58? Again, being able to marry context between stores might actually let you guess what demand for that blue sweater would be. Um, maybe you're thinking of adding a brand new brand, right, to a set of stores. What impact is that going to have on, on the stuff that you're already carrying? So as you can see, right, all of these questions are germane uh, to sort of the business of actually just the process uh, of, of, of retail. And uh, fundamentally, modeling choice gets to the heart of this task. All right. So let me let me actually skip over this, uh, you know, for a second and, 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 and go from this picture over here where we're asking questions to, let's say, a candidate output. OK, so I'm going to show you a candidate output. And uh, really what you should be thinking about when you see this candidate output is the, that nice little no shiny objects, uh, uh, you know, uh, icon uh, that you had a couple slides ago, right? This is a store clustering, okay? I'm, I'm sure that a lot of you have uh, actually worked with these clusterings or are working actively towards a clustering, right? The first time you actually look at this uh, or a picture like this, it's interesting. You're, you're asking, you're, you're saying, oh, okay, look, all these guys go together, all these other guys go together. But at the end of the day, I personally have looked at so many of these things, right? Uh, these look like colored dots on a map to me, frankly, right? And it leads me to ask, you know, what, what's the operational value of, of, of doing something like this? Once you ask this question, what is the operational value? That's a hard question, right? And coming back full circle, right, to the sorts of tasks we want to answer, Really, any clustering that you come up with, for instance, needs to be something driven off of a model of how people choose. So if two stores are going to go into the same cluster, it had better be that tells me something meaningful about how to actually assort those stores or how to manage inventory at those stores or something, uh, something of that nature. So that's, that's kind of what we do with some of the choice models that we learn. We do choice-driven clustering. Right. And what does that mean? What that means is effectively building representative models of customer choice, clustering stores based on those models and then assort, assorting those stores to those clusters. So if you will, as opposed to sort of a self-fulfilling prophecy where you put all your, uh, you know, your uh, large format stores together in one cluster and all your ethnic stores together in another cluster, uh, you know, and so on and so forth. These things are sort of self-fulfilling prophecy as opposed to doing that. You're building clusters based on customer demand, okay? Um, what does this look like at the end of the day? 
right? At the end of the day, uh, you know, this is one final point that I want to make here before, uh, you know, kind of, uh, you know, opening up to any, any Q&A, right? Uh, one final point I want to make is, you know, we talked through science in some sense. We talked through, uh, you know, a number of questions that you might want to answer uh, with this science. We said a little bit about clustering. At the end of the day, when you inject all of this into your process, um, the outputs that you get need to be easy to work with, right? Uh, and you know that's 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 one final piece, right? Some of, some of the things we're very focused on at Select, for instance, is providing you know folks across the retail process, be it in financial planning, merchandising, uh, you know, planning allocation, giving all of these people a common user-friendly view of the predictive analytics that emerge. Uh, from uh, from the sort of analysis uh, that we uh, that we that we do, so that's quite a bit. You know, I want to I want to just sort of pause over here, right? And uh, you know, really just kind of digest everything I've said. Really, what I've kind of walked you through is, shall we say, the science or the predictive analytics counterpart to all of the operational things that uh, you know that uh, that Paul was talking about. And if anything, you know, one of the key points that I wanted to get across is something that Paul started this conversation with which is we have no shortage of data, okay? You're swimming in data. There's no argument, uh, you know, against that. The question is, so what? What do you do with this data? And, uh, you know, you're at Select. You actually believe that we have a tack on this uh, that we think really kind of gets a lot of value out of all of that data that you've gone about, uh, you know, collecting so carefully. So let me just stop over there and, uh, you know, hand it, uh, hand it back over to Todd. Yeah, so thank you, Vivek. This, and what we have out of that now is a couple solid chunks of content on both uh, the process side, perhaps the integration side, the deployment side, and into the practicing side of the data. And out of that, um, there's, a, there's a few questions, I think, that, that we could ask ourselves here, a couple of which were asked by uh, attendees, but one of which I want to start off with right now. And this is a little bit more towards Vivek uh, than Paul, but Paul, I have another one for you in a second. Um, so the, the question was about the data, because you were talking about a, a lot about the, 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 the data that's required, the data that exists in organizations. So the question is more about um, where do we actually get the data from? If we're, you know, there's a question about they currently have their data aggregated into a, um, what are they calling it, a master sheet, it was called. So the question is, if we're pulling data to analyze, how do we exactly pull it from the sources? And, and also, how do we give it to them in whatever their current source of operation is, whether it's a sheet, like they said, or whatever it might be? I know it's a bloated, it's a big question, but is there a way to summarize that back in, in a few minutes in terms of like how, how we present the data to them in a case where maybe they have their own spreadsheet yeah. they're working in? Yeah, so I, I guess, uh, you know, you know and I'd, I'd look for Paul to, 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 to chime in here as well, right? But, but really... Was sort of the last piece that I was talking about, right? So a lot, you know, we're talking about all this data and all this heavy predictive analytics. A lot of it is actually today happening in, in Excel, right? And uh, if you think about this, uh, there's just like, without even getting very sophisticated, there's actually a lot of risks to this. So for instance, you know, recently, you know, we've, we've been thinking about by quantification of the, of the customer. And, uh, you know, if, if all of that analysis is actually happening, uh, you know, in, in, a, in a spreadsheet, then, um, what do you do with version control on that spreadsheet, right? Uh, but what are the chances that you're actually going to make a mistake in merging two versions of this? So that, I agree, right? There's some very, very simple things that actually need to be done around data hygiene and data cleanliness before you get here. Fortunately, I, I'm seeing, like, at least from my standpoint, a very big change happening over, uh, over the last few years where people, uh, people are getting much more open to dealing, in, you know, dealing with data in in sort of user-friendly systems that reside outside of Excel, maybe, and, you know, you know, coming back to Excel only, you know, if and when, uh, you know, if and when needed. Excel's always going to be a big piece, piece of the puzzle, though. Yeah, absolutely. I don't know, Paul, if you wanted to add something there. No, I would just say, I mean, Excel's very uh, heavily used in our client base. Uh, it's, it's a tool that's used out of necessity uh, because oftentimes the, uh, the ERP systems, the host systems, uh, the legacy systems that are out there don't have the level of flexibility they need to manipulate the data. And so, you know, as we're seeing the sophistication, the visual nature of these systems, these new systems come out, um, you, you know, there's, uh, as you said, uh, you know, there's a move toward less and less uh, reliance on Excel and, and, you know, the notable risks like version control, like, 
um, you know the you know how current the data is, how do I maintain the data? I mean, there's there's all of those kind of things that get dealt with, uh, you know, have historically been dealt with, you know, for a tool that was really used because it was the it was the one tool that was user friendly enough that the average person could, you know, could make some progress with it. Yeah. So we have another question here, and I'm just going to keep firing through these until we run out of time in about I don't know five ten minutes. Um, there's a question, and this is for both you guys. Uh, so the question was, can you provide more details on how you build customer choice models for the entire store? Um, and I'm going to read that as through across all of the stores, meaning across wherever the stores are, across the nation, across the globe or whatever. That's, I think, how we should answer that question. So, uh, Vivek, do you want to lead off on that one? Sure, sure. Absolutely. So that's a, that, you know, I, I want to avoid getting down a, a rabbit hole on the, on the oh, question, sure. but given yeah. that it's a one-sided thing, that's the minimal chance of that. Yeah. Uh, but I mean, let, let me just say this. So, uh, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm not sure, that, you know, the background of the person asking the question, but, you know, when it comes to choice modeling, by the way, this is something that was done, uh, uh, you know, in the in the world of uh, you know grocery for a very very long time, actually, right? So if I put in a, you know another brand of coffee on a shelf, what's that actually going to do? Um, really, what we're trying to do is answer that same question for retail more broadly. And the challenge in taking the existing solutions, shall we say, that you'd see in the grocery world, and kind of just applying them more broadly, uh, is that there is way more choice now than there has ever been. And customer choices are actually evolving much, much faster than they did. So really our approach to modeling choice is effectively looking at, trans in a nutshell, looking at transactions of every individual customer over time, overlaying that against the context of that customer. That is, what was the choice that they had when they actually walked into the store? And then feeding that to, uh, you know, I, I, you know, you've not said uh, very, you know, we didn't say very much about, uh, you know, IP that's core to select, but uh, there's some IP that's core to select relying on a methodology called tensor completion uh, that, uh, that you know, lies at the heart of us, and I apologize for throwing that piece of jargon out there, but it lies at the heart of us, uh, you know, being able to do this sort of choice modeling task, which used to be a very sort of manual task that you'd imagine, you know, two data scientists would do for one category over two weeks. We take that entire thing and do it across millions of SKUs in hours, right? And that's and, and that, that's basically necessitated by modern data and the scale of the problem. Paul, any thoughts from you? Uh, no, I think Vivek uh, covered that well. It's, uh, you know, with today's uh, storage, uh, Moore's Law, the processing power, the amount of storage, uh, statistics to deal with things like small sample sizes, uh, this is absolutely doable, uh, you know, at an individual store level. So going back to uh, some of some of your earlier slides, Paul, um, you were talking about some of the processes related to uh, some of these rollouts, and the, I guess some of the the higher level steps you guys take when considering um, analytics in a, in a retail organization. Uh, I guess a very high level question is uh, that I think many of the participants in this webcast might might appreciate is to understand roughly how long does it take uh, before seeing any tangible benefits, so before you're seeing any return or any adjustments and and in-store revenues or anything like that, based on your experience in the industry. Yeah, I mean, I, I think uh, one of the things that's most exciting about this, um, you know, the the sort of mashup of today's technology, the cloud-based uh, architectures, um, you know, the the new type of data that's out there, um, is that uh, you know you can do this pretty quickly. I mean, think days and weeks. Uh, instead of you know historical IT implementations type stuff that happens in months or even years, um, you know this is days and weeks. And in a test and learn environment, you know you can very quickly uh, start to uh, understand you know the you know what's the impact and the order of magnitude of the impact. And you know we always try to go forward in a in a pilot in a test and learn type environment before we scale, of course. Um, but being able to see that benefit within the test and learn environment is literally you know, is, as quickly as you've changed a decision um, and that's impacted, um, uh, you know, at the store level if we're talking about stores. So if I changed an assortment, if I changed an inventory level, if I changed an offer, um, uh, you know, in a test and learn type mode, you can start to see that benefit pretty quickly. Uh, and again, I, I think, you know, once you're past that pilot stage, the ability to scale and scale quickly, again, you're talking about uh, weeks now uh, to be able to get after that. Uh, and start to roll it out on a level where the you know the benefit becomes very meaningful, and we're seeing that you know very consistently in our in our client base. 
Cool. Um, the other question we have here that I want to address before we break here is um, what about, I guess, specialty retailers that don't have a whole ton of stores? So um, maybe not a single store, but only a few. So Vivek, what do you think of that? Um, yeah, so I, I mean, actually, even with a single store for a specialty retailer, right, um, uh, there, there's the flip side of this problem, which is a lot of specialty retailers that have a small number of stores of their own are also doing a lot of wholesale. And, uh, you know, we're, we're, we're at the end, and, and Paul can speak more to this, right? But at the interface of like, if you look at, if you look at the department store on the one end, the department store is sort of saying, listen, I'm buying from this wholesaler. Uh, you know, what store should I actually be putting this wholesaler's product in? The wholesaler has their own view of what stores their product ought to, ought to be going in. And so really, you know, even if you're a specialty retailer, if you have a wholesale side to your business, there's very much the same question that comes in, right? Uh, you know, what, uh, how should you actually, what should you actually, how should you, what's the ideal way, ideal footprint for your product across, uh, you know, all of the, uh, all the customers you distribute to? And I think there's some very, very important questions to be uh, to be asked and answered over there. Yeah, I mean, I, I think my perspective is whether you've got one store or tens of thousands of stores, uh, you know, there's opportunity to be more precise, to be more personalized, um, uh, to be more predictive and, and generate uh, business value. I mean, that's one of the places where you've got levers that can, can create value in your organization. And, uh, uh, you know, whether you do that across 10, 20, 30, 40, 50,000 or across one, uh, you know, there's value there to be, to be had. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, thank you guys very much. It's about 20 of, uh, 20 of the hour now. We've been going about 40 minutes. I want to respect everyone's time and just let you know we appreciate you coming, appreciate you listening and participating for those that, uh, that asked some questions. And of course, in the beginning, for those that, that helped with the potential audio issues in the beginning, we really appreciate it. Thank you for coming. And thank you, Paul very much for uh, for joining us today. Hopefully we'll do it again sometime soon, right? Yep. And uh, Vivek, of course, thank you again. Yeah, hey, real pleasure. <laughs> so uh, if you have any other questions, please send them out uh, to us. Feel free to send it to uh, info at select.com. Uh, my email is Todd, T-O-D-D, at select.com. If you prefer to get personal, that's fine too. Um, any feedback and all feedback is, is great. If you want to keep up on any blog posts, any news on our end, just stay tuned to select.com and blog.select.com. And we'll have the recording out in the next 24 to 48 hours. And the slide share link is right in front of you in chat. So thank you everyone for coming and we will talk to you next time.